Hey everyone, today's video is on adrenal masses and incidental illness. So before we get into it, we need to review some key anatomy and how it interacts with the physiology of the adrenal glands and relate how that works with both adrenal surgery as well as adrenal masses in general. So if you recall from your anatomy classes, the adrenal gland has two main parts, the cortex and the medulla. The cortex, uh, it's split into three main layers. And a lot of people remember this with the acronym GFR. So the outer layer G is glomerulosa. The second layer F, fasciculata. Third layer R, reticularis. But what's really relevant for our purposes is what these layers secrete. So the glomerulosa layer secretes aldosterone, which of course increases blood pressure. The fasciculata secretes cortisol, which leads to the Cushing syndrome of hypercortisolemia. And then the reticularis secretes uh, essentially sex steroids. DHEAS is the classic one. Um, this tends to cause virilization. Once you get past the cortex, you get inside to the adrenal medulla. What's important about the adrenal medulla is it secretes vasoactive peptides or peptides that severely increase your blood pressure. Um, in other contexts, we use them as pressors. So epinephrine, as well as norepinephrine are secreted from the medulla. And then once we get past those layers, we also have to think about our arterial venous or our vascular anatomy. So when it comes to the adrenal arteries, this is really more of a pimp question scenario than something that's clinically relevant. Uh, but the adrenals do tend to have a triplicate arterial blood supply coming off the phrenic vein, the aorta, as well as the renal vein. You see that on both sides. Of course, you'll note here that adrenal, ad renal, they just sit on top of the renal glands, aka the kidneys. Um, but the veins are what really matter surgically. And so you see there's typically only one vein, more or less, per adrenal gland. So that vein's a bit bigger than these arteries. It carries more of the vascular supply. And what's really important is that those stick onto some pretty major structures. On the right side, the vein goes directly into the IVC. And on the left side, the adrenal vein goes into the left renal vein. And so you can imagine if you injure that vein before you have it appropriately ligated, now you have a hole essentially the size, whatever size that adrenal vein is directly into the IVC on the right, and you can get some pretty significant blood loss. So a lot of the times, a key component of adrenal surgery is safely isolating and dividing the vein. All right, so to get back to the topic of the day, what is an incidentaloma? And that's just kind of a coin term, um, incident. Of course, we know what that means in OMA, meaning mass. It's usually some mass discovered on an imaging study that was done for an unrelated reason. For example, if somebody comes in with a trauma and you get a bunch of CT scans and you see a mass somewhere and you weren't expecting it and you're not really sure uh, whether or not it's clinically significant. Of course, today we're focusing on those that show up in the adrenal gland or adrenal incidentalomas. The challenge is how do we decide which incidentalomas are irrelevant, benign masses that have been there for a long time and aren't going to cause any problems or are ones that need treatment. And we're really doing this with limited data. We can just, we have at our disposal, our history and physical exam, our labs and imaging studies primarily. And when you think about it, that's unique from a lot of other scenarios where we have uh, the ability to just biopsy the tissue and get the answer straight away. So why don't we do that with the adrenal gland? And the problem with biopsying the adrenal gland is one, it's high risk. So if you can imagine, uh, one, it's kind of a small gland, it's back in the retroperitoneum, it's a little bit hard to get to, hard to biopsy. When you do biopsy it, it's a very high risk of bleeding. Also, you're at high risk of sudden hormone shifts and releases. For example, um, if you stimulate the medulla, you can get a big rush of epinephrine, which could cause um, critical hypertension and complications of that. And finally, there's the possibility of tumor seeding. If you have a bad adrenal tumor, um, there's thought that that needle tract could actually be a location for some local recurrence. And finally, it's just not that useful. Um, a typical biopsy might be an FNA or a fine needle aspiration, and that actually cannot tell the difference between an adrenal cortical carcinoma or ACC, which is the typical malignant cancer of the adrenal gland versus just a benign adenoma. So you have high risk of complications, low reward. You almost never 
biopsy an adrenal mass. Take that out of your vocabulary. The only exception is if a patient has a known tumor or a known cancer elsewhere, and there's a high suspicion based on imaging that the adrenal mass is a metastasis from that tumor, and knowing that that's a metastasis has to change your therapy in some way. If they're widely metastatic, you already know it and you wouldn't change anything, then there's no reason to do that high-risk biopsy. It's only, for example, if you're getting surveillance imaging, there's a mass, and you might actually change or initiate chemotherapy or something along those lines where that biopsy would make sense. So just remember, we don't have biopsies. We have to use our other tools to decide how to treat these incidental illness. And when we're thinking about these, what is our differential? So there's really three main categories of any mass. And you can have benign masses. Of course, that's the best case scenario for the patient. You can also have masses that would otherwise be benign, but that secrete hormones, which are called functional masses. Or you can have malignant cancer. And so when we're talking about the adrenal gland, examples of benign lesions might be just a benign adenoma that doesn't secrete anything. Uh, also, a classic lesion is a myelolipoma or a cyst, some sort of infection. Uh, functional lesions, these are based on those layers of the adrenal gland that we looked at before. So you can imagine that a functional adenoma of the glomerulosa layer would secrete aldosterone that would cause hypertension. Uh, one of the fasciculata would secrete cortisol, cause Cushing syndrome. The reticularis would secrete DHEAS, cause virilization. And then a tumor of the adrenal medulla, which has a special name, of course, which is a pheochromocytoma, that would secrete epinephrine and cause intermittent hypertension, headaches, flushing, etc. Finally, you have your cancers of the adrenal vein. There's really two main types. There's ACC or adrenocortical carcinoma. This is a very bad cancer. Um, patients do not do very well if they have adrenocortical carcinoma. Uh, the other option is metastatic disease from somewhere else, like we talked a little bit about before. So keep these in mind. We'll go into a bit more detail about how to diagnose these and how they're treated. But that's kind of the differential you should have in your head when you think about an adrenal mass. So like we said, we don't really have the option to biopsy, so we have to use the tools at our disposal. And how do we use these to work up an adrenal mass? Well, within your history and physical, you're looking for any signs of those functional syndromes caused by hypersecretion of the adrenal hormones. So again, aldosterone and hypertension, um, cortisol and Cushing syndromes, DHEAS and virilization, um, pheochromocytoma and intermittent hypertensive crises. Uh, labs are used both to work up functional syndromes in and of themselves and to confirm what you discovered on your HMP. So everybody should get a test for Cushing syndrome, which is usually a 24 hour urine cortisol, plus or minus a one milligram dexamethasone suppression test. Um, you should also absolutely test everyone for a FEO if you ever have any suspicion. And that's done with plasma or urine metanephrines. And then if the patients have symptoms found in your HMP, uh, for example, hypertensive hypertension, uh, in that case, you would get potassium, and renin and aldosterone levels. Or for example, if they had signs or symptoms of virilization, then you would send out the DHEAS and sex steroid panels. Finally, imaging, there's a lot of detail here, so we're gonna cover that on its own slide. So imaging for incidental omas. Let's say, for example, it was just discovered on a normal CT. You want to go back and make sure you get a good CT adrenal protocol. So what does that mean? One, it's going to have thin cuts through the adrenal glands. You get a really good look at the adrenals. And secondly, it's going to have very specific protocols. So you're going to get a non-contrast phase. You're going to get a delayed contrast phase. And you're going to get, sorry, I should have said this before, non-contrast, venous phase, and then a delayed phase. And so there's specific findings in each of these phases that are critical for working up an adrenal mass. The first is on your non-contrast study, you want to know if the adrenal mass is greater than 10 Hounsfield units or less. Um, greater than 10 is concerning. Less than 10 is very reassuring that this is likely a benign lesion. You also want to look at your delayed part of your protocol for washout. And what does washout mean? So if you give contrast and the tumor lights up to a certain degree. In the delayed phase, the question is how much contrast washes out of that tumor. And so the way I think about it is low washout means something that doesn't have much vascularity 
um, that does not hold on to contrast very much. And of course, if we think about cancer and how much cancer brings blood vessels to itself, requires a lot of nutrients to grow, um, you can imagine that something that holds on to contrast well, so something that does not wash out very much, a low washout, that is concerning for cancer. Whereas if something washes out easily, it takes in contrast and gives it up very quickly, that's less likely to be cancer. And then, of course, bigger is always worse. And an important cutoff to think about in adrenal and telomas is four centimeters. So again, CT adrenal protocol, three phases. What you want to know is the Hounsfield units of the mass. More is worse. Again, I always think about tumors, liking blood, liking contrast. Brighter is bad. Um, a low washout is bad. That, again, means this lesion likes blood, likes contrast, and is more likely to be malignant. And then, of course, a bigger size is more concerning. So we have these categories. We have our HMP, we have our labs, and we have our imaging. And who needs surgery? So anyone with a functional syndrome needs surgery. So anybody with hypertension and signs of an aldosteronoma or a Cushing syndrome or a pheochromocytoma with a intermittent hypertension, all those people get surgery. Anybody with concerning imaging findings. So remember the high Hounsfield units greater than 10 or the low washout less than 50. They need that mass taken out with surgery. And any mass definitely over six centimeters is highly suspicious for adrenal cancer. It needs to be removed. Who, so who doesn't need surgery? And that would be patients with a lesion less than four centimeters without concerning imaging findings, talking again about the Hounsfield units and the washout. However, if you don't offer surgery, you do want to follow these up closely, uh, usually with a repeat CT adrenal protocol in one year, just to look for interval growth. If it grows usually more than a centimeter or if it develops concerning features, then you would want to take it out at that time. Four to six is a bit of a gray area, kind of a case by case basis. If there's no concerning features, um, obviously if there were concerning, you'd operate. But if there's no concerning features, four to six centimeters in somebody who's young, healthy, got a good life expectancy, would tolerate surgery. Usually you're going to take that out, but in certain high risk patients, you might not. All right. And then a couple special surgical considerations. One is the surgical approach. So a lot of these, especially ones where you you're, have a low suspicion for cancer, you can do laparoscopically or MIS. I say that because you can alter, also do this through the retroperitoneum. Um, however, situations where you're very concerned for ACC, remember that's the malignant lesion of the adrenals. Those are, again, big, bad cancers. They have a very poor prognosis, especially if you don't take them out and block. If you violate that capsule or leave anything in there, the patient's going to have a bad outcome. So typically those are recommended to be done open. Of course, that's changing as people get more expertise. But in general, um, if somebody says ACC, you should think about an open adrenalectomy. And the final situation I wanted to talk about is a pheochromocytoma. Because you can imagine a tumor that secretes epinephrine can have very severe side effects. And there's some special things we need to do perioperatively for people with pheochromocytomas. Number one is you need a pre-op alpha blockade. That's frequently done with drugs like doxazosin. And you want to block their alpha receptors so profoundly that they're borderline hypotensive, just at baseline. They're, they're going to be quite miserable for these two weeks while they're on the alpha blockade. But it's very important to prevent them from having an adrenal crisis in surgery where they're incredibly hypertensive because of manipulation of that pheochromocytoma. You want those receptors completely blocked so the epinephrine can't work on them. Second, during your surgery, uh, you need good communication with your anesthesiologists. Because when you go to ligrate that adrenal vein, it's basically like you're turning off the epinephrine that this patient's been on for the last however many years this tumor has been growing and their blood pressure is going to plummet. And so the anesthesiologists have to be ready to counteract that with a bunch of fluids, a bunch of pressors. And very frequently, these patients are going to need the ICU post-op while their, well, their vascular system kind of equilibrates out to not being used to having those high doses of epinephrine. All right, so a brief review. Incident lobas are common. They're only going to become more common as we do more and more imaging studies, and those imaging studies pick up smaller and smaller uh, resolution findings. So we have to know what to do about them. Adrenal incidentalomas are an important topic because we can't just biopsy all of them and say, what is this? Uh, just get a little tissue diagnosis and know exactly what to do. We have to be able to systematically work them up because 
rather than biopsy, we usually can only get tissue via surgery because biopsy is not helpful and high risk for bleeding. So you need to know your criteria based on your history and physical exam, um, your functional syndromes, which are picked up by the HMP and confirmed by your lab tests. And then finally, uh, your imaging criteria, both in, in terms of the size, remember greater than four centimeters, the Hounsfield units greater than 10, or the washout being less than 50, all being concerning for malignancy or um, some other sort of harmful lesion that needs uh, to be excised. All right, uh, that's it. These videos are for educational purposes only. Do not use them to diagnose or treat any diseases, and we will see you next time.